Um, hi everyone. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Everything good. Awesome. So my name is Juan Carlos. I have been doing a PhD on the political data science for the last three, three and a half years. I'm actually almost finished, or actually I just finished my PhD. And um, I, I was uh, investigating and researching uh, how politics and data science can work together. And of course, one of the big topics in the last years was uh, misinformation, disinformation on social media. And uh, today I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about how we as data scientists, how we can fight uh, misinformation or what can be done against it. Um, so to start with, I, I wanna go a little bit to the past. Imagine it's 2017, uh, we're, we're, we're traveling in the past. The misinformation uh, topic is not that big yet back then. I'm starting uh, to, to research about it. And uh, back then, when I had to do a, a, a talk uh, to, to some people about this information, I needed to explain why it was important to study this information. Uh, so uh, someone wrote that he cannot hear me, but I hope that everyone else does. Sorry. Um, Oh, perfect. Sorry. So imagine again, 2017, uh, I had to convince people why this topic was important. So we had had the election in 2016, uh, Trump won the presidency. There was starting to talk about fake news, but they, 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 they influenced the election, but it was not still not clear if it, there was a real effect, offline effect of misinformation on the online world if it had translated into the offline world. Yeah, so uh, there, there's this, uh, there was this conspiracy theory called uh, Pizzagate in which uh, there was this idea that the democratic leaders had a, a ring of, of pornography, of child pornography in the basement of a pizzeria. And they have found out this after reading some emails between the head of the Democratic Party and there was like, they, they were ordering pizza and there was this conspiracy theory that there was actually a child pornography ring in the basement. So there was this guy that went there and with a, with a rifle went inside the, in the pizzeria, didn't shoot anyone, that's super good, uh, but it, he, he did throw some, uh, shoot some, some, some in the air and he demanded to, 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 for the owners to show them the basement to free the children. And the, the funny thing it was that this pizzeria didn't even have a basement. Okay, so it was like all this idea. And uh, why was it a case of misinformation online? Because the hashtag Pizzagate was, was spread by a, a large amount of, of, of accounts on Twitter of social bots. Social bots are accounts that look like normal people, but they, they are actually sharing uh, junk news. They are trying to push an agenda and they're mostly automated. So they're just trying to reach more people and trying to set some trending topics. So uh, th back then, 2017, 18, there were, uh, there were a lot in the news. What would be the effect of social bots on the election? Were they a threat to democracy? And of course, uh, back in the 2016 election, there was this idea of Russian interference. Had it had, there, had, it had an effect on the US or not? Of course, it's, it's not possible to, to really quantify it. Uh, the only thing we can see is like, for example, here are some uh, ads, Facebook ads that, that the uh, Russian internet agency published. And as you can see, they were, they were both pro-Trump, uh, but they were also pro-against Trump. So it was mostly, they were trying to, to polarize, to polarize um, uh, and not just uh, support one candidate. So this is what, what mo most of the of the ads that they were on Facebook and, and, the, and the different pages, they were like trying to, to create this polarization. And uh, here in Germany, uh, when investigating the, the right-wing political party called the Alternative for Germany, Alternative to Deutschland, uh, I realized that there were a lot of, of fake accounts. They were not bots, 
there were fake accounts that were uh, showing a lot of support to this party. So they were always sharing their content. And for example, you see this one, one fake account where the, where the image is actually uh, an actor from, uh, I think, Ireland, and he had just pictures of, of girls, and he was always sharing all the content of, of this far-right uh, po political party. And when I start continue looking at, at other actors, there were other quite weird uh, accounts that were supporting the party, because you have to think this is an anti-immigration party, right? So it's like, you have like some uh, uh, kind of, uh, 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 different kind of of, of, of of memberships that the party has it was somehow weird. And after looking at a lot of these accounts that were always sharing the, the, the these contents, uh, I realized there were accounts all over the world supporting the alternative for Germany, right? So there was like this one in Chile, uh, liking always the, uh, the alternative for Germany. I don't think they even know what is that down there. So, uh, so of course there's there's a like uh, this whole idea of fake accounts, social bots, misinformation, uh, disinformation campaigns. But but again, before in 2017, 18, 19, there were like really not uh, effects that we can we could see with our eyes, and this of course changed uh, last year, right, 2020, with the with the coronavirus there was a lot of misinformation online. And now for the first time, we, we were able to see that it could affect us directly, right? If all these people, conspiracy theories, were pushing the ideas of, uh, of not getting vaccinated, of not using a, a, a face mask, so this could affect uh, us all as a society. So there were effects going from the online world to the real world, with especially this uh, QAnon uh, conspiracy theory, or the origin of the of the of the of the coronavirus, and of course we what happened this year. So there we we saw an effect of this misinformation of stuff the the steel uh, going to a real world event, and we I don't need to to go to a conference anymore and explain what is important to studying this information, right? And why can data science really be a, a tool against it? And when I say uh, data science, what, what can data science help us? Well, the, the biggest thing it can do for us, of course, is detecting, right? The big companies, big tech companies are using uh, methods of, of data science and machine learning to detect uh, misinformation and, of course, do something about it. If you detect it, then you can moderate it, uh, uh, the, the content. But the problem is it's not easy. If you have pornography or violence, these are things that the, the, the algorithms are very good in detecting. You can trade them with few examples and the, the algorithm, the, the machine learning algorithm will detect the videos or text that are using this kind of, 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 of things that should be censored. But when we're talking with, about misinformation, then it gets really tricky. Because if you're just discussing about conspiracy theories, you're saying, for example, there is a conspiracy right, there is a conspiracy theory about uh, Pizzagate. It doesn't mean that it's actually you're, you're 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 contributing to this conspiracy theory. You're just discussing about it, and it's very different if your sense is to tell the others, "Hey, this is true. Believe this." So it's a really fine line, and it's really not easy to moderate, especially when you have like videos or, or podcasts of people talking on YouTube or on, 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 on another platform for hours, and there's like misinformation just in, in, in some part of the video, and, and not like it's not everything false, right? So it's a really hard challenge. And uh, I want to discuss two of my research papers. I will, the, the rest of the talk will be focused on these two research papers because I thought instead of telling you about all the possibilities of what data science can do, I prefer to just focus on two cases so that you kind of get the idea of what can be done uh, to understand uh, uh, misinformation and to also how to deal with it and detect with it. So uh, the first one is the spread of uh, conspiracy theories on social media and the effect of content moderation. And the second one is NLP-based feature extraction for the detection of 
misinformation on YouTube, you can uh, Google them later if you're interested in the research and you can of course read them and ask me any questions later. So uh, what I did with my team at the beginning of last year was collect a lot of, of, data, uh, of data points from different social media, from Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and Fortune. And between January and March, so the very beginning of the pandemic, and uh, of course not any post, but post about coronavirus and about coronavirus and man-made or biological weapons. So we were like searching for these uh, for these keywords on, on social media, and we collected 300,000 posts. And from these posts, we extracted the, the URLs, the unique URLs. And of course, when, when you want to understand what is happening, you need to label, right? We as data scientists, we cannot start directly implementing the algorithm. We need to first to understand the data to be able to later build a system that detects this, uh, detects this, this kind of, 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 of data, right? So we labeled the, the 11,000 between supporting conspiracy theory or used as evidence for conspiracy, because this is also a lot of things that a lot of, of, of users do. They want to prove a point and they, they, they show an article, for example, from 2000 that talks about the coronaviruses in general, but it's not about COVID-19, and they use it to, to for, consp for conspiratorial purposes, right? So it's also part of the conspiracy theory. It's not only like it's, it's something invented, but it's really sometimes that it's true science, but it's, it's twisted, right? So this is also something that needs to be uh, labeled. Or, of course, it's not, it's not conspiracy. And uh, the, the, the big question, what, what can we do with this data set, is to understand how does the virality of these URLs can travel between platforms? How did these uh, uh, different news went from Twitter to Facebook to 4chan to Reddit? How did this? How is it? How can you measure virality in a very complex system? And it's not that it's only between platforms; it's also within platforms, right? You also have uh, the, the retweets, shares, or, or 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 this kind of stuff. So it's a really complex ecosystem, and uh, our goal was to understand how. The, the information diffuses to the different platforms. So um, the, the, I'm going to show you the results before showing you how to do it, okay? So that you first get an idea what we found out. So uh, imagine we measure somehow virality, it's a, 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 a parameter from minimum and, and maximum virality. And if you see that matrix, you have to read it in this way, you go from a column and column Facebook, and then you see how Facebook influenced the rest of the rows, of the rows of the platforms. So in this case, you are seeing the virality of neutral content, okay, no, no, no misinformation content. And as you see, like, there's a lot of content that goes from Twitter to Facebook, and also from Twitter to Twitter, like, in, in, when you look at the diagonal, it means that it, on the same platform, how it spreads the, the, the information in general, like, considering the all the URLs, it's not about one URL, it's all about the whole ecosystem. We're trying to understand the virality as a whole. And uh, as you see, like there are some very, uh, uh, there's some virality, but very normal, as we can see. Like there's nothing that, that we would see. It's, it's something weird, it's just normal platform to platform interaction. But when we looked at the conspiratorial URLs, and we just took not the debunking, but the conspiratorial, how they diffuse. On the platforms, we see a very different uh, virality. Especially if you look at the diagonal, you see like uh, in these kind of URLs are really, vi they go really viral on, on, on their own platforms, but also to other platforms. For example, you see that from Fortune, there's a lot going from Fortune, the column Fortune going to, the, to Twitter and also to, to Fortune again. And then Twitter, then it's also going to Facebook and then Facebook back. So it's, uh, the question is, uh, how, how, how did we measure this, right? So it looks like nice, okay, there, there's a higher virality of conspiratorial, that, that's something that everyone expected, right? Uh, uh, that there's some, that, that uh, misinformation travels faster online. Well, we are trying to prove this and we were proving this. And uh, so let me show you how, how we can, can you measure these kind of complex, uh, complex uh, dynamics 
on all other problems that you may have. So you can use a very interesting uh, statistical tool called the Hox processes. And the Hox processes uh, work as part of uh, another, uh, a sub, it's a subset of, of techniques called temporal point prop. And if you remember Statistics 101, when there were some, uh, when, when there were some events happening, you have some timeline, time zero to time T, and there are some events happening. There's an event that happens, there's the next event, there's a next event, and you want to understand what is the latent distribution that is generating these events, okay? So uh, if, you, if, if you want to understand temporal point processes, you have to be like at one point of time T, and you know what happened before, there's this probability before and probability after. Interesting is that at the point T, nothing has happened. The next event hasn't happened. So event one happens, event two happens, event three happens, but event four has not happened. So there's a probability distribution of when the next event will happen according to the previous history. And for this, there's the, the conditional intensity is the probability of the event happening in the, at this point of time t plus some delta, so the probability almost of now happening, if there was no event in the last t from t minus one, okay? And it, it's the, the most famous uh, temporal point process is the uh, Poisson process. And this is, I, I'm sure, every, this is like the famous Poisson distribution. Uh, so the idea is you have a lambda, the Poisson distribution, and in the Poisson process, you have like one, one single continuous distribution of intensity. Okay, remember the lambda is the, the, the intensity and the probability is constant. At every point of time, in the, irrespective of what happened before, it is the same. And uh, the, the, the times of what, is, what can happen, the, the inter-event time, they follow a simple exponential distribution of this parameter mu or, or the, the intensity. So it's just an exponential time, uh, time minus some time. So it does depend on where you are and the last point, how much time has happened from the, this, from the last uh, time that something happened to the point that you are now. Okay, so I hope you remember something about this from your statistics course. Uh, this is like the, the most simple process of something occurring. For example, uh, uh, cars going through a highway, right? And this, this is, you can model it as a Poisson process of every two minutes, every two seconds, there's a, ca a car passing through this highway. This could be like one uh, real example. And uh, to, get, to make it more complicated, of course, we need to model something more complex than just uh, simple events and homogeneous, there's the Hux process. And the Hux process works like this. You have at the beginning, at time zero, you have like a continuous uh, intensity. And in the moment that the first event happens, everything changes. Now you have a different, a different uh, intensity. And uh, also the next points have the different density. And this is like an idea of burst, like an event happened which caused other events to happen afterwards. So imagine, for example, Twitter, you tweet an event, uh, you tweet a URL, and then this gets retweeted afterwards, and it's really this burst of one causes the next one, the next one causes the next one, and it's, uh, it's happening very quickly. And then probably it stops being shared, and then there's this, this big time space, and then it starts again getting shared all, 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 all over again. So this is a self-exciting process. It excites itself when something happens. And its model now not con it's not a constant mu, mu, but it's now plus some contribution of every time step that happened before. So if you have to see the sum there, it means a sum for all the history of what happened before of some parameter alpha multiplied by a kernel you know, kernel, a kernel function of time. And normally this kernel function is simple also, again, uh, a exponential, but now you have a contribution of every of the past points. So the, the main difference from the Poisson process to the Hox process is that history does matter, right? It matters what happened before to model what happens now. And if you have a Hox 
process, it's great to model one platform, like one URL being shared on one platform, but we're talking about a complex, different platform ecosystem. So you need hot processes, not just one, but several. And how it works is that one event on one platform can also have some effect on other platforms. So imagine we have three platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. And if you have one event happening in, in Twitter, then imagine at point one, if you see the number one, there's event one, then there's an exponential of probability on the platform Facebook and the platform Reddit that if something occurs and the next event occurs. And in this case, in this example, event two occurs on Facebook. And this creates, again, a process on the other platforms that an event can occur. But of course, like you have to, the, the, from one to two, it's not very realistic because you also have to think about yourself on your, how you, one event affects your own uh, platform, right? So that after point three, it makes more sense. It's actually more like real life. Something is posted on Reddit and then there's going to be a self-exciting process on the other platforms, but also on itself, on the, on the, on itself. And then event four happens and it goes on and on. And of course, uh, these exponentials in this drawing, they all look the same, but the idea of the modeling this process is that they're going to be different, right? Like if it happens on, on Twitter, it may be that it takes like 10 minutes for it to appear on Facebook. And then from Facebook, from Facebook, it can go back to Twitter or something like this. And of course, we don't have, uh, we don't know exactly how, how this happens because we don't, we cannot follow one user how we posted on, we took it from Twitter and posted on Facebook. This we cannot have. We only have posts on different platforms and we have timestamps. And we can model this general what happened on the diffusion pattern but we cannot really follow one URL going through the path we can only follow like a general uh, diffusion uh, diffusion of all the platforms and now the, the, of course the the, the 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 formula gets a little bit more complicated instead of having one summation you have two summations because you're summing not only the points that happen in the path but you're also summing the d dimensions the d platforms that you have so you have like all points in the past are somehow uh, affecting you in the present. And you have an extra parameter alpha in the kernel that ij means that going from platform i to j, where it could be yourself. And this has been used before in literature or in experiments to measure virality. How does, in general, the model, when you model it, how does the virality from one platform to another can be measured? And this is exactly what we measured. And how do you solve this problem? The easiest approach would be simple maximum likelihood estimation. So a simple fitting technique that you know from machine learning, but of course you can make it more complex and do it using a Bayesian approach or uses a more complex uh, sampling, like gift sampling, which can help you to uh, try to model the posterior distribution of the parameter alpha because that's, that's your point, right? The whole thing is about modeling alpha, the virality. Okay? And as the final result from, from, from this complex modeling, we found that the, the, the moderated content from, from, from the platforms really affected the virality uh, of the URL. So we compared moderated uh, content and unmoderated content, both being conspiracy theories. Imagine we have like this bunch of conspiracy theories URL and the platforms only manage to, to moderate uh, this percent. And we compared how did these two subsets vary with virality? Did, when Facebook uh, moderated, flagged or banned one URL, did it have an effect on the other platforms, right? And we see here is like percentages, you multiply by 100, you see, that is a 96% difference between the moderated content and the non-moderated platform uh, content in the same platform and on other platforms that even a bigger effect, 99%. There, you see like everywhere there's like a big uh, difference between uh, uh, moderated to non-moderated content. The only place that we didn't find any difference was on Twitter because we think that on Twitter when you start 
the Twitter is more about real time. So it's the, the, the trendiness of one URL is mostly uh, the first few hours or, or one day, and then it's, it's not popular anymore. Whereas on the other platform, it can continue to appear several times, and it's not really trendy of what, what is new. Okay, so I talked a lot about math in this first part. Uh, the last thing is that we compared how much percentage of the content was moderated from the platforms, and we compared it between April and May. And as you can see, uh, for example, Twitter moderated 20% of the content that we flagged, that we labeled as misinformation, and one month later they had already uh, banned 50%. That's good. On Facebook, there was very. Uh, way less because it was also more content on Facebook. So it was way harder. It was like 10% that had been removed. And on YouTube, there was uh, this change from like 10% of the content was removed on, on April and 30% on May. And we still, I haven't checked. It would be interesting to go now, like one year later, and see if these, all this uh, content that we flagged with misinformation, if they are already, uh, if they are already removed or banned. Uh, or not, right? So uh, I'm going to make a small intermission. I'm going to take some questions because I know I talked a lot about math and, uh, uh, and about modeling. So if you have, I'm going to read the questions here. Uh, so the first one says, how did we label the thousands of data points? Uh, hopefully not by hand. Yes, we did by hand. Yes. Why? Uh, because uh, w when you're doing social science, sometimes you need to label all. Okay, especially when, when, when you have news, which are very different. It's really not uh, comments or, 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 or there are news that are very different, different each time. So you really, uh, will, you can use some AI, of course, but it was not our, 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 our purpose. It was more to identify as, with, as a data scientist how these uh, URLs uh, uh, vary, uh, diffuse through the network. And on, on the next slide, I will talk about detecting uh, uh, misinformation uh, automatically. Of course, that, that's the goal. But the goal of this project was not to detect it automatically, but it was about trying to really quantify misinformation on platforms. Um, the second question, why did I choose this platform specifically? Well, it was a uh, design decision at the beginning of the research. We could have also taken uh, uh, other platforms, but at the moment they, they, were, they were the most uh, popular on sharing uh, misinform, uh, like the biggest platforms on, on, and of sharing news. For example, we didn't, we didn't there was no uh, TikTok content because on TikTok, you know, you don't, you don't share the URL. You, you just comment it or you, you talk about it, so you're not sharing. So we choose the platforms where sharing was like the main, uh, the main. Uh, uh, one of the main parts of the platform of the social media. And the last question is, uh, how did I model, how did we model the, the prior for alpha? Uh, we, we actually, uh, we did it with, uh, we did it with uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, we tried it with, with the Bayesian, but uh, it worked, it, did, it was not co converging because of, you have a lot of, we have like 11,000 URLs. And they, they were not uh, converging. Normally, uh, it, it's kind of harder, and, and we had the MLE uh, solution. Yeah, but of course, uh, I'm also Bayesian. Uh, Bayesian I, I like Bayesian more. And uh, for this was more of a social science paper. So if you just present them the MLE solution, it's already quite good as a solution. Any other question about the, this uh, first part? Okay, so we I will continue, and then at the end, if you have, uh, you, we can come back to this, to this, uh, the text, uh, to, to these topics. Okay. So um, the next part, the, the next research we did, we said, okay, like 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 you, it's like your question, uh, Jen, um, we wanted to detect things automatically, right? Now we wanted to use really the classification tool from. From, from our toolbox of data science. And now we want, our focus is not about understanding diffusion. We want to understand how to, under, how to detect misinformation. So we focus only on, on YouTube videos. 
okay, not on, on all the news, on YouTube videos, all talking about coronavirus and, and the origins of coronavirus. And uh, we wanted to find a way to, uh, uh, we wanted to find a way to, to detect them, to detect these, these videos on their own. And detecting videos is hard because you, uh, you know that uh, videos, it's not easy to classify them. So we had an idea, we had a hypothesis how to deal with this problem. And the hypothesis is very simple. It's not, 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 not very complex uh, thoughts. Our idea was, so uh, misinformation videos about COVID-19 uh, have a higher number of conspiratorial comments. So imagine you have two videos about uh, coronavirus. One is talking about some uh, real facts of the origins of coronavirus. The other video is really talking nonsense about, uh, about Bill Gates. So we, our idea, our hypothesis is that if you look at the comments, the user-generated content, the videos that are conspiratorial would have a higher amount of conspiracy, conspiratorial comments. I mean, every video will have conspiracy theories running on, 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 under, underneath it, right? This is going to happen everywhere, but we, we expected that there would be more if the video was also conspiratorial. So our approach was uh, NLP-based. It was not computer vision-based. It was NLP-based. And our methodology was very simple. So first, classify the user comments from YouTube as if the comment itself is conspiratorial or not. And then use the percentage of comments that have a conspiratorial content as a feature for a video classification algorithm, which could include more features, especially if you're like YouTube, you have like a, a lot of information about the video, you know, if people, they, you can flag videos, so you have this information, uh, you know, if the user has been uh, posting misinformation before, so you have other features, but you can have this extra feature uh, the percentage of comments that are conspiratorial. So uh, this is the data we had. We had a uh, very reduced data set because if you had like 11,000 uh, um, 11, URLs and then you look at the YouTube videos and then you look at the ones that have more than 20 comments because there are also a lot of videos that are, have probably 100 views and no comments so we could not really, uh, they were not useful for our, for our study and we had the misinformation and the factual. And each of them had a lot of, a lot of comments, 32,000 comments and 120 comments. And now uh, the, the, to, to use uh, NLP, so we labeled now not all the comments. Now we didn't do the same as the last time, of course. We labeled 10% of the comments manually, again, as, uh, as a conspiratorial comment or not. And again, I should mention this is quite hard. It's not very easy to classify them, so we really have to get a set of rules to decide, uh, and if you're doing research, you need to at least two people to do the uh, to do the labeling, right? You cannot do uh, just one person doing the label, but it should be two, and see how much they how much percentage they overlap, and it's never going to be hundred percent. You have like 80, 90 percent of of, of of correlation between two uh, label data sets is already quite good, really. Uh, when you're talking about uh, so uh, subjective things. Okay, so uh, we labeled this 10% and now, of course, now we could use this to label the rest of the comments and we use uh, a train test as a strategy of, of machine learning using different algorithms. So, of course, we first used a baseline algorithms of natural language processing and I would always recommend to use some baseline, uh, some kind of bag of words model or a dictionary kind of model. In this case, we use LIWC. It's a dictionary-based uh, technique in where in which you uh, take the word, and each word has uh, there's are, are are matched to to sentiments or to or 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 uh, aggressive words, or they have like every word has a different like dictionary set of categories, and you use these categories to try to do your classification. There's na na naive base naive base which I think I don't need to explain, but if you don't know, you can uh, search for it. And of course, those as baselines, and then as a comparison, we use now really transformer models to make classifications on the comments. Because we had a lot of comments, we had like 
the the uh, to train it on on three on on the ten percent of comments, but then we can we could use it on the rest of the comments to classify them. And as if you see the train test here, the 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 the, the accuracy was really good with the with a complex transformer model with Roberta. We had like ninety six percent of 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 accuracy, which is quite of good on on training data set. Of course, you know neural networks are good at at, at overfitting everything so you will probably always get the hundred percent if you want to so the best thing is you always need to have the test data set and it was around 86 percent which is uh, which looks not big difference to the test from the baselines when you compare 78 to 86 you say actually 10 percent is not that much but if you look at the at the precision recall uh, of uh, curves you see a big difference like now you really see a difference and that's why Whenever you're doing classification, you always have to compare F, F1 score, precision, recall, and not only accuracy. Okay, remember this is important, and you can see the red lines are really pretty good around every re point of recall and precision. And, and, and the other way, you have like uh, a lower base on the baseline models, okay? So I think I don't have time to explain the transformer models because this will take me like another 45 minutes and I don't have much more time. But uh, uh, this is some like the, this is like the tool work that we have right now to do uh, classification using text, right? Because you have comments and you can really classify them one by one. And, and when we classify the complete completeness of all comments, then we found out that the, the misinformation videos had a mean number of percentage of conspiracy comments way higher than the non-misinformation videos. So in this case, you see like, the, like most of the non-misinformation videos had less than 10% of comments with conspiratorial content, and you had like around 20% of, of um, an average the misinformation uh, videos. Of course, we didn't have a perfect feature which divides in two, in two beautiful curves where you can really use just one feature to separate between non-misinformation and misinformation. You don't have it because, as I mentioned, these are all videos that are talking about the origins of coronavirus. Yeah, so they could, they, they, there will be some conspiratorial comments always. It's not going to be different. So, but you see that there is really a feature where we really somehow separate uh, these kind of videos and we can use it to a more complex algorithm. And uh, the second step was using, okay, we know every video, how much percentage of comments are conspiratorial. Let's use it as a classifier for the videos. And we had very few videos. We had like 300 videos. So you, you, you cannot use again, Roberta or Bert or Transformer because it's like very few videos. So you can only use the, the more traditional machine learning techniques and we use with different kinds of features. The first, we use only the title, the title of the video as a feature. Then we use the conspiracy percentage as a feature, which is exactly what, what, uh, what, uh, what we, we calculated before, and some kind of a combination of, of title and conspiracy percentage, and also use the comments themselves, like not the, 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 the percentage of conspiracy, but using the comments themselves. And for this, we use three of the most famous classification methods, simple, logistic regression, SDM, uh, support vector machines, and random forest, very simple to classify uh, videos uh, using this feature. And I, from all these combinations, the ones that had a bigger digital test, test accuracy, I didn't mention this is test percentage, not training test. We found it with 89% using the conspiracy percentage feature and using the comments themselves as a feature. So the words that appear on the comments. Would you say, okay, it's not perfect, it's not 100%, but we were not aiming to that. We were aiming to find some feature that could help us identify and divide videos, conspiratorial videos and non-conspiratorial videos from each other. And the, the most interesting thing that we, we found out is that uh, the accuracy is similar if you look at videos with less than 100 comments. This is very important because this means that videos that have the first comment, you can already know somehow if there are going to be a lot of conspiratorial comments uh, coming in the future, which this means it's going to be a good method for using a simple feature 
for online learning. And remember, online learning is you have your machine learning model and you're getting data all the time and you're changing the parameters to trying to, 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 to classify uh, anything you want. And the cool thing is that you only need a counter per video. Imagine you're YouTube, you cannot do a very complex computer vision classification for every video about coronavirus. You don't have, even if you're YouTube, you're Google, you're like the biggest one, they don't have the power to really classify every video. They use other features that are simpler, and if they flash one video, then they use really more complex computer vision techniques. But if you have this method where you're just really counting for every video, every that could be conspiratorial or not, and classifying comments is very cheap, even if uh, Roberta or Bert are very complex models, just at, at, at training, but at test time, they're very fast. So you can, for every video, have like a small model, compress model, that is trying to get this counter uh, to, to counter uh, the, the number of, of, of conspiratorial comments, and it works for the first few comments, so it can work for, for new videos that appear. And why is it important to know uh, new videos that appear? Because uh, this is one case of, the, of this, this one YouTube video called the pandemic video that went viral really quick, and you see the number of inter million of interactions. After two weeks, it was turned down, the video was uh, banned from YouTube. It was this huge conspiracy, conspiracy video, uh, theory video, but it was already too late. And if you had had one algorithm that from the beginning, from the very first comment, had decided this could be something that we should flag, it could have been that they could have, could have detected it quicker than, than, than they did. And if you see that some comparisons with other famous videos of the number of interactions, how, how big was this? Uh, uh, this this uh, video. So with this, I, I hope I, I, I could uh, help you understand a little bit how you could use data science to, to fight this information, to detect this information, uh, to detect the flow of the information, to classify videos. And, and now I'm going to so, uh, answer some of your questions. I see some very a lot of questions here. Thank you very much. Uh, let me go uh, to the questions. Uh. Yeah, thank you so much, Juan. Everyone can press it and give a <laughs> virtual applause round again. <laughs> yeah, great. Really, really great talk. Thank you so much, uh, Juan. Do you see um, the rest of the questions? Uh, yes, I, I see them. Okay. Feel free to read them out. Yes. And later on, um, we can continue also in an personal, also in the casino. If you're free to approach one as well, I'll, I will right. try to answer two or three of them. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, if, if I consider, we consider using Telegram or WhatsApp. Yes, we have those are like other research we have done, but it's really hard to to. There are like open groups on on Telegram and, and WhatsApp, like that you can uh, uh, investigate. And there's a lot of conspiratorial things happening there, very interesting, but uh, we, we didn't use it for our, our, our research, but it's definitely a lot of big research is doing in, the, in this area. And now on the NLP side, uh, uh, the question is, why did you use more misinformation videos than factual ones? Uh, how representative of this is, this is a good question, right? Like you would ra rather have an algorithm that have like thousands of normal videos and few of misinformation videos. Uh, sure, so the, the best approach would be to now try this algorithm without this kind of, 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 of imbalance. Uh, normally when you have, when you want to do classification, you have this big imbalance of having 3% of the comments being 2% of the videos being misinformation and the rest not, then you would, uh, the first step would be to do some stratified sampling to train your model really with the same amounts of, of uh, similar amounts of, of videos and then scale it to, to see if it works in, in production with a lot of videos. Uh, but uh, we tried it with normal videos that we're not talking about coronavirus and of course you, there were not many few, there were not a lot of, of, of comments that were conspiratorial in those videos. So we were really focusing on those that were already having the, 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 the words man-made 
uh, bioweapon. So where they were already, let's say they were already like filtered videos of videos that could potentially be misinformation just by reading the title. Um, two more questions. Uh, what's the different improvement of Roberta compared to Bert? So uh, uh, that's a very cool question. So Roberta is actually just Bert. But on, 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 on steroids, it's like going from GPT-2 to GPT-3. So you have a lot of more parameters uh, on your model. And it's trained also longer for more epochs. And they don't use the, the you know, but with BERT, you have like two, two uh, tasks to train. The first task is, uh, uh, the first task is just to, to model uh, the representation of the input to be the same as the output trying to have the same input and they have a second task which is uh, uh, next sentence prediction so you have the next sentence prediction in BERT and Roberta has not this next sentence prediction uh, as, and in the algorithm that's, that's the difference and they, they found out with Roberta that this makes it more robust uh, last question I think it would be interesting to research how many conspiratorial comments are found on their factual information videos. Yeah, that's true. So like in, 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 in factual videos that debunk this information, there's also going to be uh, a, a, a lot of conspiratorial comments, but this is exactly what we tackled. We had our, 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 our group of videos of 300 videos. You have videos that debunk. And you had videos that they were uh, really trying to, to tell you this is the truth. Bill Gates did this to, to us and, and such. Uh, 